Um, welcome, everyone. Um, good morning and welcome to all of you who are here today. Um, and those that will be watching this online, we've, we've lost a few to the to the state, the fair state of Florida, I believe. The snowbirds are immigrating, and some of you will join the exodus here soon, but welcome to everybody. And right after service, I do invite everybody, like Jim said, um, Dan said, you know, stay for the annual harvest dinner. Um, the only thing that stands between you and that dinner is my sermon, which is, which is skillful planning on the pastoral staff, I am Mark, one of your pastors, along with Dan, and I think Dan did this on purpose. He didn't want to be standing between this, the Word and the food, but God's Word is a feast, amen? So we'll, we'll start right there first, and join me in prayer if you would. You know, Father God, good morning. Uh, we're gathered here this morning as your people call by your grace through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel. It's the best news ever. And thank you for the resurrection, which is our hope. Help our hearts love what you love so that we find favor in your sight. Bless our time together and keep us safe from the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Charles Spurgeon was a Baptist pastor who preached in London, England, during the 1800s. And his sermons always contained three points. The sin of man, the grace of God, and the beauty of Christ. And Charles preached over 3,500 sermons. Sometimes he preached 10 times a week. Um, and he, he preached during the same era as the most famous biologist of all time, Charles Darwin. And Charles was um, preaching and teaching evolutionary theory while Charles Spurgeon was at the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church and he was <coughs> preaching the Word of God. And there were... There, their worldviews could not have been more opposite. And they were both Englishmen. So you might understand that time in the 1800s was dynamic. This is the Metropolitan Church where Charles preached. And many times the congregation had to get up and go outside to let the new people come in. I think of that each time some folks tell me I, I, I like a small church. I think of Charles' church. Charles didn't think about the size of church. He thought about who was coming to it. And Charles was, Pastor Spurgeon was quoted as saying, somebody asked me how I got my congregation, why I never got it at all. I did not think it my business to do so, but only to preach the gospel. Why my congregation got my congregation. I always ask my congregation to preach Christ in the pews. Get a hold of the people who came here and tell them about Christ. I know people are a little starched up about the matter sometimes. A little mahogany comes between them and their fellows. But in the church, there should be cordiality. The feeling that a man may venture to speak to his neighbor. To say at least, how did you enjoy the sermon? To start the conversation and detain him for a little while. You know, sometimes we think back about that age that was, right? And there's a, there's a bubbling up in us, oh, the good old days. We live in the good old days. By grace, we live in the good old days. And that's exactly where I'm at today. I am, I'm right where Charles was. Interestingly, in that church, that church, the testimonial elder records list over 14,000 conversions in their testimony during Spurgeon's 38 years in the pulpit. He's known as the Pr Prince of Peach, uh, Preachers, Prince of Preachers, um, and he preached about the sin of man, the grace of God, and the beauty of Christ. And that's kind of a preview of what this pastor is going to preach about today. So, uh, same thing, and we can find it in every single book of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Did you know that faith in the Old Testament was faith in a Redeemer yet to come? I mean, we're familiar with the New Testament period, right? The New Covenant. And we have faith today by grace in what? In who? Christ, who already came. In the Old Testament, as you read it, please understand that they had the, 
promise given to Eve by God in, in the garden, given to Adam and Eve. It's Genesis 3, 15 and 16. You should read it. It's the theme that's in every piece of our Bible. It's God's promise of a Redeemer to come. So as you enter the Old Testament, understand he hadn't come yet. But their faith in that he would come is what was faith in that era. Today, we know our faith is in one came. It's the same Jesus. It's the same Christ. So, but today we'll be in the Old, Old Testament. And Jesus referred to the Old Testament as the Scriptures. And we're in Exodus chapter 32, and there is great drama in Exodus. There's great plot. I mean, there's good guys. There's bad guys. Uh, there's mystery. There's intrigue. I'm going to read the whole text for context. Some of you have read parts or all of Exodus 32 before. I know you have. That's why I brought the calf. <laughs> there is a calf in the story. This will go this way. There is a calf, and I will put that calf right here. Now, there's a tendency sometimes when you have read a story and someone else is going to read the story that you jump to the end of the story because you already know it. I'd caution that. Let's read it together, and let's dig into God's Word and see if we can discover the pearls in there. There are many. I'm not going to have the verses on the screen today. This is old school. We're going to go through the Bible. As a pastor, one of my roles, one of our roles, Dan knows in the eldership, we, we would love to have you read your Bible, not just for an hour on Sunday. And you'll see why when we get through the text. But, okay, so turn in your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 32, or you can scroll on your catechism devices. <laughs> if you have one of those, that's allowed as well. Um, and we can title this, We Become what we worship. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool, and he made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings to the people. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord and said, the Lord God, and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent he brought them up to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them in the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens. And all of this land of which I have spoken, I will give it to you and your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain and the two with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablet. Now when Joshua heard the sounds of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, 
It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the song of sound of singing I hear. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hand, and he shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made, he burned it with the fire. He ground it into powder, and he scattered it over the surface of the water, and he made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did the people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself. They are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let him tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all of the sons of, his, of Levi gathered together to him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourself to the Lord, for every man has been against his son and against his brother, in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out of your book, which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, leave the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf, which Aaron had made. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. And I read the whole chapter. I know we don't typically do that, but I did it for context. Did you see in this text just one chapter of one book? There are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, and all of them are packed with the sin of man, the grace of God, and the beauty of Christ. What's the chances? <laughs> For those who say that the Old Testament speaks of an angry God and the New Testament speaks of a loving God, they have not reviewed the scriptures properly. And so we will today is my prayer, Lord. Um, you know, being a pastor is a little bit, there's a little bit of anxiety that goes with that. I, can, I hope you can appreciate it. To stand before a group of people called by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and those who are contemplating giving <laughs> by grace their faith to Jesus Christ, there's a little bit of a apprehension. I want to do it right. Here's the best way to do it right. I just do what God said. <laughs> I don't really put much of what I think into it because what we'll read here, here's what people thought in those days. And if you think that people thought differently in those days, well, let's, let's begin. You see in the very beginning verses of the chapter, um, the people just say, come make a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt. We don't know what's become of him. They want a God they can see. They want a God they can see. I mean, they chose a calf. We as people can choose a lot of different gods. They just happen to choose a calf. And I know we giggle about it when we put it up there, but it's actually a symbol, and we'll get into that as well. But, you know, the book of Exodus is marvelous, marvelous, isn't it? You know, Moses is a young child. He's cast along the, the, the river in Egypt. He's supposed to be killed. He's not uh, by grace. And then he's found by Pharaoh's daughter. She names him, which is, names him Moses, which is intriguing. Do you know what the name Moses means? 
God's deliverer. Well, that's intriguing. Love how the Bible names fit with the person that's in it. You ever notice that? There's not a coincidence to it all. And I mean, and then you've got great plot. You've got a burning bush. Uh, you've got ten plagues in Egypt. Uh, the last one, the Passover, the angel of death, where all the firstborn uh, people and animals die. Um, it's a great scene. Some of you are old enough to remember Charlton Heston. Let my people go. I think you, you remember that. It's a great movie. Uh, not always accurate, but it was a great movie, um, <laughs> biblically. You know, they had the Passover, as I mentioned, and then we're, we're scrolling Red Sea, which is actually the Reed Sea. It's very shallow. It has a lot of reeds, and we have one million or more Israelites make it to one side. It wasn't a small contingent. It was over a million. We know there were 600,000 men, so we know that, okay, and everybody following them perishes We've got food from heaven. We've got water from a rock. We've got ten commandments in Exodus. And they're divinely cast into stone. And the people agree to the ten commandments. And here we are in chapter 32. It's only been a couple of weeks since they got the commandment. And they're breaking the first two. Thou shalt not have another God before me. And thou shalt not make a gra graven image. They're already busting the first two. These people... The sin of man. The text is set up in chapter 32, and we, um, and it's a calf made from earrings. It had to be a lot of earrings, because there wasn't a calf that size. And where did they get the earrings? Well, God had them take the jewelry of the Egyptians before He freed them. And so they've got jewelry that was never theirs anyway, and they gave it to Aaron. And Aaron puts it in the fire, and he makes a calf. And interestingly, in this passage, they've got a God that they can see, that they can worship. Here's what I'd have you know. They are becoming what they are worshiping. And that is the takeaway of the whole text. They're becoming what they worship. How do we know? Well, we know because it's verse 6. So the next day they rose up early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And you can read right over that and not understand that how God is helping us understand. They're becoming what they're worshiping. Any farmers in here? What do animals do? They eat, they drink, and they do a little play. That's it. That's all an animal does. They eat, they drink, and they play. That's it. And did you know that you, created in the image of God, were created for much more than eating, drinking, and playing? Now, some people, they think that's all there is to life, eating, drinking, and playing. The text would have us know, no, you are wonderfully and fearlessly made, and you are made for so much more. And we actually know that. What do you mean when you say such and such is on their video game again? What do you even mean by that? You mean that they're made for so much more than the video game, the text tells us, but they're becoming what they worship. Why wouldn't they be? They don't have a godly view. And so Moses is just up on the mountain with God. He doesn't know what's going on yet. He's 80 years old or more. He was called when he was 80. And he's up on the mountain with God. He doesn't actually know what's going down at the base of the mountain. But the Lord helps him understand. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people whom you've brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, when the Lord says a double imperative, Go down at once, it's kind of like, Get down there. <laughs> get, get down there. Richard, get down there. That's kind of what that means to Moses. Moses doesn't know what's going on. So the Lord fills him in about how the, the people down below, the, the fellow Israelites who just agreed to the commandments, they're already making a molten calf. And the Lord says, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. And when I read that, I just think, man, you don't want to be in that group. Do you? That the Lord looks upon them and says they're an obstinate? What is it? Actually, I read the NASB, New American Standard, and some of you have the NIV. I like that verse. In King James 2 has stiff-necked. They're a stiff-necked people. Well, stiff-necked was, was obstinate. It just kind of calls it out. You know what sniff, why they put that in the translators? Stiff-necked pride. I will not turn my neck for pride and listen to anything God or you have to say. I am right, right, it's called pride. 
ever seen it. They're stiff-necked. So God looks at these people and says, they're just, they're just a bunch of stiff-necked people. And then he says, you know, Moses, leave me alone that my anger may burn against them, and I, I'm going to destroy them. And I tell you what, Moses, I will make of you a great nation. Stop. God just offered Moses the king, the keys to the kingdom. There's Moses. He's on the hill or on the mountain, doesn't know what's going on below. God says, I will make of you a great nation. That's not a bad offer. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And who among us might not take that offer? Like, hmm. 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 But here's what Moses does. Moses, then Moses entreated the Lord as God and said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? God, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who you renamed Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and all this land which I have spoken. I'll give it to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Moses is doing what at this point? He's actually pleading with God to not get angry and wipe the people out. Where, where'd that come from? He's been given the keys to the kingdom. Why shouldn't he take it? Who has Moses been worshiping? Who's he been with on the mountain? Correct. Some 40 days. God. He's been in the presence of God, y'all. And that is a very important thing to understand. Compassion. He's showing compassion. In a couple more chapters in the book of Exodus, Moses gets a, a glimpse of God. A glimpse. Who is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, and who will not let the guilty go unpunished. So that's the first component. It's a character of God. Compassion. The God we serve, that we love, who loves us, is compassionate. And Moses has been in his presence, and he's actually becoming what he's worshiping. He's becoming compassionate. Hmm. Don't miss that. It's wonderful. Moses goes down the mountain. He runs into Joshua. Joshua says, I think there's a sound of war in the camp. And Moses is not really sure. He's just getting down there. And he says, no, wait a minute. That's not the sound of triumph or the sound of defeat. Are the people dancing? It's dancing, I hear. Yeah, they're dancing around the calf, having a good old time, eating, drinking, rising up to play and dance. It's a wonderful life. Isn't that a movie, too? <laughs> yeah. Moses gets angry. Moses gets angry. And sometimes, uh, you know, he's been in the presence of God. Let me speak about that anger of God. Let me, let me speak to that just a little bit. Sometimes people say, you know, I don't, I don't really like to think about an angry God. Or yes, here, here's how that works. Um, all of us, all of us, long for justice. Every time you say, good should win over evil. How come somebody doesn't do something about that? How come somebody isn't going? Who has ever said that? You all have. I know. You are pleading for justice. And you do not want the guilty to go unpunished, right? Into that steps people. And we don't know who they worship. And they might bring a more or less righteous judgment. We do the best we can with people. But the one who truly is perfect in his judgment is who? God. Do not back up when somebody asks me as a Christian, about your angry God. I, I turn right around. Why, well, you don't like good guys who win over bad guys? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's God. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just chaos. Good luck. That's Charles Darwin. To the survivor goes the spoils, man. What They don't understand what they're saying, but it's in them, and I already know it. So it's in it's baked in us. How do, we, how do we get it to come out? Well, it depends on who you're worshiping and what you're worshiping. Moses is worshiping God, and it's coming right out of him. And there's a little bit of anger comes out. He gets down there. They got this calf. What does he do? He throws it in the fire, grinds it up, puts it on the surface of the water, and makes his brothers and sisters do what? Drink, Drink it. <laughs> Great scene. Great drama. Wow. And then he goes to his brother, Aaron, where are you at? Aaron, what did you do to bring sin? of the people upon them. And what does Aaron do? I love this part. Aaron does, Aaron, well, you know, Aaron, Aaron, hey, brother, hey, man, hey, dude, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people? 
They're prone to evil. For I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. Say, hey, man, they just simply gave it to me. I tossed it in the fire, and out came this calf. That's what I, I really didn't have much to do. You know what? What did Adam say when God asked him about the forbidden fruit in the garden? Who did Adam blame? God. Look, honestly, if you would have been here, you would have seen. I'm good. Her, you got to work with. Aaron, Aaron's doing the same thing. It's called the sin of man and women. Sin does that. It's not me. <laughs> Look, Aaron, Aaron, I didn't do it, man. If they would have been to me, Moses, I know you were gone. I was good. They just gave me this. Their earrings. What was I supposed to do? I just threw it. In there. I made a calf. We know that's a lie. A calf didn't come out of the fire. The earlier part of the book tells us that he crafted it. Aaron crafted it. So he's lying. I think that's another. Anyway, it, so we, we just see the sin of man. Please know. Here's what we do as Christians. We have to know this sin does that. It blames the other person. Pride blames the other person. Jealousy blames the other person. If I want to, and, and there's, a, there's, a wonderful, there's a wonderful bit about that I'll get to in a minute at the, at the end that why that is. And then Moses has said, who's ever for the Lord, come on up to me and the sons of Levi now. Moses and his brother Aaron and their sister Miriam, they're Levites, they're from the tribe of Levi. And so the Levites join him and they do what? They get a sword and they go through the camp and they kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. And 3,000 men of the people fell that day. 3,000 died, is what the scripture tells us. Which is interesting because in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we know that 3,000 people came to faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here we have 3,000 people that are killed. And then the last part, the last verses. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I'm going to go up to the Lord, and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Atonement for your sin. Atonement for your sin. Where have we heard that before? Jesus is the atonement for our sin. Wow. This is mercy. It is the beauty of Christ. We've had the sin of man. Charles Spurgeon could have preached this wonderfully. He did. We've had the grace of God, and now we have the beauty of Christ in the passage. Moses also has mercy in his heart. He's going to go to the Lord to make atonement for whose sin? Then. It wasn't Moses' sin. He was in the presence of God. He just came upon it. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin. Now they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out from your book. Moses is saying, forgive them. And if you won't, do what? Take me. Take me in their place. That is the ultimate mercy. You know, we had recognizing you veterans. Thank you so much. When you, I, I did not serve, but I have a deep reverence because in some picture in my mind, I picture this sacrifice that you all gave in any capacity. It's an unselfish capacity. Grace of God. Grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. It's given to you. Mercy. The mercy of our Lord. So God, if you're not going to forgive them, please don't kill them. Take me. Take me. It is the beautiful picture of the coming Messiah Amen. in Exodus. But the God says, well, whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot him out of my book. But not now. But go lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel will go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. I think that's in Revelation somewhere, Jim. You're teaching that in your Bible study. Yeah, someday. There's a someday in Revelation, right? Okay. Then the Lord smote the people. He brought a plague because of what they did with a calf which Aaron had made. There it is. The sin of man, the grace of God, and the beauty of Christ in the passage. And you see absolutely that people in the passage, that are just like us. They're just like us. They just lived 3,500 years ago. That's all. 
Moses lived about 1,400 and some odd years before Jesus. So we know it's 3,500 years ago. Here's the people. And they become what they worship. They're eating, they're drinking, and they're playing. They're singing. There's nothing wrong with those things, by the way. We have to eat, we have to drink, we have to play. We like to sing, Mary Ellen. It's just who are you becoming and what are you becoming? That's what this talks about. And you see the three different judgments brought in this book. It's quite interesting. The first one is Moses alone. Moses brings the judgment by himself. Comes down from the mountain, he gets angry, he sees the calf, and he throws it in the fire, right? And he grinds it up and has the people drink it. That's just Moses. That's just Moses. The second one, God calls Moses. You know, he says, um, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every man of you put his sword upon his thigh. That is God working through Moses. Moses didn't come up with that. That was God through Moses. So we see that as the second judgment. And then the third one, God just brings a plague upon the remainder of them. That was God alone. So the guilty are never not brought to justice. I think that is so powerful right now as Christians. I'm way over my limit of hearing about the injustice in our time. I got it. I got it. You got it. Please don't join the division of the enemy, which is division. You see, Satan can't redeem you. He can't seal you. Certainly can't call you by grace through faith. Can't do anything. What can he do? He can divide you. Against who? Each other. In the church and outside the church. I won't play along. You may if you wish, but I won't do it. Because I know how the game is run. I have worshipped. God just long enough that the compassion, the mercy, the patience, the loving kindness and truth has bubbled up in me. It needs to bubble further. But I ain't just eating and drinking and playing and being one of them. Because they don't need anymore. God is in control. He always has been. And once you know his nature, you'll, you'll understand. We become what we worship. Um, interestingly, there are the characteristics of God uh, that Moses will see, and they, we're just so blessed to know about in two more chapters. There's the symbol of Wall Street. I find that intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Where'd they come up with that? Now, money is not evil. Money is just a thing, right? But interestingly, how there is worship of money, there's wor but there's worship of a lot of different things, and that's the key. We become what we worship. What's your molten calf? That's the question. God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Jonathan Edwards is America's finest theologian. He lived in the 1700s, and he wrote a marvelous, marvelous book called Affections. It's about the heart. The Bible speaks often about changing somebody's heart, circumcising your heart, giving you a new heart. Why does God think about the heart so much? Because, see, we're really smart people. What do we think with? Our brains. No, Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s wrote his thesis, which is still used today, but he crafted it from church fathers, the affections. Did you know that wherever your heart places its passion, the mind will rationalize away? I mean, if I want to rob a bank, that's my passion. My mind will tell me why people owe me, and I'm deserving. The mind will rationalize it, and then my human will may, will make a way. It's everywhere. Whatever you set your heart on, your mind will rationalize it, and your will will make a way. That's fascinating. Your mind really doesn't steer you in any capacity. We have been taught in our time that our mind keep increasing your knowledge, your knowledge, your knowledge. There is so much knowledge in here, we'll never get it. It'll take an eternity. And some of you have been in the Word long enough to know the more you learn, the less you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating. I mean, that passage you read today is one passage. There's so much packed into it, right? 
In closing today, though, I'd like to reflect on how we can live out the gospel in our lives. So this, this is where, how do we take this, Lord? How do we take this and use it in our own lives? So, so the sin, here's the gospel in presentation form. The sin of us, men and women. Well, first of all, pray that the Lord... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why. Um, I thought it was appropriate that it sounded the buzzer right when right when it's time to kind of dive into the application. That was good timing. I think it keeps me on track. Actually, you know when a pastor takes a watch and puts it up here, you know what that means? Nothing. <laughs> That's right. It means absolutely nothing. The sin of men and women. So we pray that the Holy Spirit would guide our heart. Keep increasing your knowledge and have a plan and all of that. But, you know, let it guide your heart, your sinful pride. Mainly to do what? Not blame others. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to see. It's the world we live in. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's the world we live in. But it's not the world we just came into. Aaron was doing it. And Adam did it. It's been with us forever. Please don't be surprised when you hear it. I'm not. It's the, it's the nature of us. It's the nature of human beings. We are totally depraved and from Adam. I'll be darned, that's the doctrine of the church. I'll be a son of a gun. It's been with us since the beginning. Um, and then the grace of God, which is the next one. Maybe. It's a gift. You did not earn it. It is from God. And he would have you worship him above all else. You know the commandments, the Ten Commandments. Some look at those as a rule book. Some view this as a science book, best how-to live life book. That's not actually any of what the scripture is. God's beautiful story. He knows that its story resonates with you. You get together, you talk about a good book, a good movie you saw. Story is in us. He gave us the story. And the story is a gift. The Ten Commandments, the four first parts are all about God, and the next six, the last six, are all about people. Because God, like a good father, knows. Not He knows, first of all, he knows you can't do all of them. We can't do them. You're supposed to need a Savior, a Redeemer, somebody to help you out. That's Jesus. Um, but the grace of God is a gift. Just appreciate it. Thank him for it over and over and over and some of you have had some hard times and some grieving times and trying times lately right health issues and family issues and things and you've you've had this paradigm of of so hard over here but so wonderful over here what's that about my heart breaks for those that don't have a church and don't have a people and they're all alone come around them and just offer them grace and mercy where do you get it? That's the next one, Mary. <laughs> the beauty of Christ. Read the Bible for a change. There's a play on words there. See, we won't have a God that we can see. He's not a visible God. Yet, we know he's coming back. And the people in that day, in Aaron's day, Moses' day, they... We can understand, right? They just wanted something to see. It was such a um, turbulent time. I'm sure that things were on end. They'd seen a lot of things. And so have we. So in that, read the Bible. How, how do you get changed? How, where do you worship God? I mean, this is a great start. We're in church. We're together as a family. This is wonderful. This is where you change, y'all. This is it. The Word of God. Read it for a change. Don't read it as a rule book. Don't read it maybe even like your mom and dad taught you. Maybe not even how you're... Just read it. It is for your good. And by reading it slowly, surely, over time, it does what? It changes you. How did Moses get changed? He was in the presence of of a holy God. It's probably the hardest thing we do in our lifetime 
is remind ourselves and get our butts back in front of a holy God. Because everything that the flesh, the world, and Satan would have us do is, as they collaborate, is suck us away from this. Look, the enemy knows where you'll be changed. He doesn't even mind the Bible. He just doesn't want you reading it, relying on it, faithfully, praying about it. And it's okay to not understand all of it and not know where it's going all the time. You know who wrote it. Some of these formative passages, Genesis 3, 15 and 16, that promised to the woman about the Redeemer to come. This passage that I just had up there, Exodus 34, 6, who God is. You can read about Jesus in the scriptures. You know that Jesus was killed and resurrected. We celebrate it every Easter, right? It's all true. And you can rely on that. Even when you're not quite sure, what does that mean, Pastor Mark, about that? That's okay. We become what we worship. And so where do we spend our time? And how is it forming you and me into Christ-likeness? We hear about that time. Become like Christ. How does that happen? And in great fellowship among other believers. One of the testimonies recorded by church elder um, there at Metropolitan Bible or Metropolitan Tabernacle where Charles Spurgeon um, preached was of a Mr. William Cartwright. The year is right around the Civil War, 1962. This is what the elder wrote, one of the 14,000 conversions. I love these old stories, don't you? He came to hear our pastor last April and continued to do so several times without profit. But on one occasion, our brother Spanswick, must have been somebody in the congregation, sought an opportunity of asking, asking him whether he had ever thought of his soul's salvation. He acknowledged he had not. He was urged to seek the Lord in the Bible. <laughs> that was good elder advice, Jim. <laughs> he did so, and he soon discovered what a guilty sinner he was. Sin of man. And that God would be just in condemning him. The grace of God. <laughs> the mercy. But his only plea was the blood of Jesus. That's a great testimony. One of 14,000. It's everywhere. Let's pray. Father, in our Bibles, we do find story after story about who you are and who we are. You've revealed that you are a God of compassion and grace, patience, love and truth, where the guilty will not go unpunished. Thank you for your world of the word, which is creation, your word to the world, which is the Bible, and your word for the world. Uh, that's your son, Jesus Christ, who took on flesh and dwelt amongst us. Praise you, God, for everything you give us. Truly, you do all things for our good. In your son Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.